Hello and welcome to St Michael's. Um, unfortunately, um, our normal sermon that we upload um, hasn't worked this week because Chris Burke, who's the Archdeacon, came and we had some technical problems. So I just wanted to share a couple of pages from a book on James, which ties into our passage at the end of our James um, series, which I think is worth listening to. Um, this is what the author, Sam Albury, says about the last part of James 5. He talks about prayers that God loves to hear. There is another deeper point that James is making. The things Elijah prayed for were not arbitrary. He didn't ask for drought because he was fed up with all the drizzle and needed some bright sunshine. Nor did he pray for rain because he realised his flowers were beginning to fade. Elijah's prayers come in a context especially significant for a point that James is making. First, as we've seen, it was a time of enormous spiritual adultery under the reign of Ahab. Second, drought and rain are significant in the Old Testament. God had said early on in the life of Israel that if they turned away from him, he would send certain punishments, one of which was drought. Deuteronomy 28, 22 says, The Lord will strike you with scorching heat and drought. The sky over your head will be bronze, the ground beneath you iron. And it is because of this that Elijah had the confidence to declare to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. 1 Kings 17, 1. The drought God's people experienced was not just bad luck, but judgment on sin. It was a shot across the bows, an expression of judgment in their present to wake them up to the reality of what they were doing so they might turn and be spared greater judgment in the future. And the particular sin behind their rebellion was very clear. Elijah put it bluntly. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Now this should ring a bell because it is exactly the same issue that James has identified in his readers. The people of Israel were wavering between two opinions. They were double-minded, trying to have a foot in each camp, hoping to get what God would give them and to take what Baal could give them. And this is the same problem that has been behind much of what James has written in his letter. And it was because of this that Elijah prayed for God to discipline them, for rain to be withheld. And then, after there was repentance and a wholehearted worship of the Lord, he prayed for the discipline, that discipline to be lifted and for the people to be restored, for rain to return. So yes, Elijah reminds us of the power of prayer, but he reminds us of the power of prayer in a particular context, bringing double-minded sinners back to God. In other words, our prayers are powerful when they are prayed in line with God's purposes and promises. That is why it is the prayers of a righteous person that are powerful and effective, James 5, 16. Because the more we are shaped by God's grace to us in Christ, the more we will, we will become like Christ, longing for the honour of God's name and the increase of his kingdom, praying the first lines of the Lord's Prayer because we desire to, rather than because we are told to do it. It is a wonderful privilege to pray according to God's purposes, as they become our own desires, and then watch our prayers change things as God responds to them. And God is in the business of restore, <coughs> restoring lost sheep, Luke 5, 15, 3 to 7. So was Elijah, and so should we be too. It is to this vital ministry that James turns for the final words of this letter. For the ministry Elijah had to the people of God is one we are all to have one to another. Listen to what James 5, 19 to 20 says. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over 
a multitude of sins. And James shows us the seriousness of wandering from the truth. And this is no small matter. James says it risks death, verse 20, to wander from the truth is to wander from life. But the trouble is that wandering doesn't feel risky at the time. It feels like being adventurous, exploring a little, getting off the beaten track. We do not know we have made a mistake until it is too late and we look back and see that adventure was in fact folly. And this is true for us spiritually too. Being double-minded does not feel dangerous. It feels like getting the best of both worlds, like becoming relevant, like enjoying all that life has to offer. And it seems even less dangerous when others around us are doing a similar thing. We can't all be wrong, right? Yet it is too easy for an unspoken rule to emerge in our churches, indicating that a level of worldliness in particular contexts is tolerable and even encouraged. What that level is will vary from church to church and culture to culture. It might concern greed or materialism or gossip or lust or worry or any number of other things which God tells us not to do, but which the world around us encourages and celebrates. But however comfortable it might feel, to wander from the truth is to wander towards death. It is spiritual suicide. Either wandering will keep you from the truth, or the truth will keep you from wandering. When there is this kind of wandering in our churches, and there will be, we are to go on spiritual search and rescue missions. If someone should bring that person back, verse 19, my brother or sister's wandering um, is not just their problem, it is mine. We are to urge the wanderer to come back to wholehearted faith, loving God with their whole life. It might be someone close to us or a member of a Bible study group. It might be someone from church and we're conscious we've not seen them from a while. It might be an ungodly relationship they're in or the pursuit of ungodly priorities. Whatever it is, Trying to bring that person back from a, a such departure from the truth is not easy. In fact, it can feel incredibly awkward. Living in the UK, it is thought to be very un-British to confront someone over something personal, however gently and appropriately it is done. It is not really part of our culture, or to be honest, our church culture to involve ourselves in the personal affairs of others. It is thought to be meddling or a sign of self-righteousness. We've always been taught to mind our own business. And in any case, we don't like conflict. We don't like to risk a relationship or cause a scene. We'd rather keep out of things. But whatever our cultural reservations, James is unequivocal. I'm not called to be English, I'm called to be Christian. And part of that calling is to seek to restore the spiritual wanderer. Notice that it's not just the responsibility of the church leader. James is addressing brothers and sisters, verse 19. It is one of you that might wander. It is someone that is needed to bring them back. We must not tell ourselves that it is just the role of the pastor or leader. If the wanderer is a Christian believer, a Christian brother or sister, and you know that it is happening, then it is your responsibility to call them back. It needs to be done carefully, of course. Paul has the following help for us on this. Brothers and sisters, notice who he is addressing. If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Galatians 6 verse 1. We need to be humble. It is only by God's grace that we are not in the situation ourselves. And we may well have been so on other occasions. There is a need for gentleness and self-examination. It needs to be done carefully, prayerfully and lovingly. 
but it does need to be done. And the wonder of the gospel is that it can be done. It may risk the friendship, even if done with love. It may cause offence, even if done with care. But it is worth doing. You may end up saving a life for the death of Jesus, the Lord Jesus of the glory. James 2 verse 1 can and does cover over a multitude of sins. Chapter 5 verse 20. You know that because you know it covers you. If you call someone back from wandering away from the cross and towards hell, you are literally saving their eternal life. There is always a way back because at the cross there is always hope for the double-minded. There is always hope for all of us. Whatever you do, remember this, says James, verse 20. So my thanks to Sam Albury, whose words those were, um, and hopefully that's something that will encourage us um, to be like the shepherd who goes out after the lost sheep to bring people back and restore them into fellowship with God. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, you know our hearts. You know that we've often wandered. We thank you, Lord, for those people who've told us that we were going the wrong direction and that we needed to turn around and come back to you. Help us do that with our brothers and sisters, those who've strayed, those who've um, stopped coming to church, um, those who are um, doing things that don't honour you and are moving away from you. Give us strength and courage and to humbly and in love go and talk and share with people about your great goodness and restore people to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.